Hi, everyone. My name is Christy Kirkland, and I'm with the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation. We'd like to welcome you today to our Smarter Together webinar hosted by Georgia Tech's Strategic Energy Institute. Uh, our topic today is accelerating EV deployment in Georgia. If you have questions for the panelists uh, during this broadcast, just feel free to use the chat or Q&A function. And at the end of the session, we'll save time uh, for your questions. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to today's moderator, Rich Simmons. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, and it's wonderful that you've decided to spend your lunch hour with us. Thanks for uh, you know, participating in the webinar. I want to welcome you as Christy did. I am Dr. Rich Simmons, and I work with the Georgia Tech Strategic Energy Institute. And um, we have a significant opportunity to engage with um, some folks that are at the front lines of uh, electric vehicle deployment, uh, decision making, policy, and planning. And we've assembled a wonderful um, set of panelists today for you. I'm going to just read their names, and they will probably include uh, a bit more on what they're currently doing in their remarks. But we have today uh, Alex Trachtenberg, who is the Energy and Sustainability Manager for a subdivision of the uh, Fulton County government. We have Mark Smith II, who is the Senior Planning Policy Coordinator at Georgia Department of Transportation. We have Karen Winger, who is the zero emission vehicle lead for the Southeast with WSP USA. And then we have Mike Tinsky, who is a professor of the practice and former director of electrification at Ford Motor Company. So thanks to the panelists for joining. Um, I'm going to frame it for a few minutes here just to sort of get us kicked off. Um, and then the format today will be um, kind of a, a formal round of um, prepared remarks by each panelist but plenty of time on um, the second half for some, some good interactive dialogue. And we look forward to your questions as a part of that. Um, as we were preparing for this session, one of our panelists, Mike, actually encouraged us to think about framing the EV uh, adventure a little bit as uh, from the viewpoint of a book that's being written uh, with many chapters. And I really like that analogy. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I wanted to provide you some personal perspectives on that um, and also share a bit of a, a personal story. So um, when I was a little kid in Chicago, one day um, my dad got home from work with a new gadget in his car. It was the late 70s and it was a, a, a mobile phone in his car. And that thing was mounted on the, <clears throat> the hump where the transmission was because the, of course the gear shift was on the steering column um, <clears throat> and the vehicle, you know, the phone even had a cord and uh, two, two little antenna with the coils on the, on the trunk. And he was part of an early trial with Motorola, a few hundred units, pilot demonstration in the Chicago area to see whether this idea of mobile communication had merit, right? And so, um, that was an early chapter of the story in mobile communication. Um, also, around that same time frame, he was getting his executive MBA from the University of Chicago, and he did the nights and weekends program. He brought home <clears throat> a computer that he actually coupled with his phone handset. He would plug that thing into the analog um, modem and do schoolwork on the computer, right? And um, of course, that was a, another chapter in a similar book that was being written around uh, communication and sharing of data and online um, access. And so I think those are wonderful um, examples. Uh, one, one other point that I'd like to make is when we think about a book, you, you've picked up several probably uh, where, where it's probably many tens of dozens of pages before you get to chapter one. And I believe the, uh, both the mobile communication and the uh, information technology books are like that. And I think the EV book is very similar as well. Um, so one final quick personal story. I was in uh, Dearborn in one of my early jobs working with Ford in the late 90s, uh, working on some electric vehicles. Uh, at that time, a, um, a Ranger electric pickup in 1998. 
And uh, what we concluded was that that vehicle uh, could, could show technological merit in delivering on this idea of, of replacing the internal combustion engine with a battery and a motor. It was uh, very, very heavy. <laughs> it had lead acid batteries. It got 40 miles of range. Um, the, the grid that was recharging it was not necessarily that clean. Uh, it was rather expensive but it demonstrated a proof of concept. And I think uh, this is an important framing for this uh, panel to say, hey, fast forward a couple decades and all of the great work from many stakeholders. And we can now see that we're um, sort of at a point on the cusp of deployment. So um, with those sort of framing ideas, I'd like to just sort of challenge the panel now individually, uh, one at a time to go through and talk about um, <clears throat> their activity in this space. Um, what are some targets that are being established? What are the appropriate time horizons? What are the objectives and drivers? Uh, why are we doing electric vehicle deployment? Um, what does good guidance look like? And for whom are we uh, making uh, suggestions and recommendations? Um, and why is collaboration important? Um, as well, like who is the community that we're trying to serve and how can we ensure uh, access and availability of these uh, really innovative products for everyone? Um, how are we preparing to develop a workforce and, and, and develop a, you know, a pipeline of uh, right people to enter this new market? And then how do we adapt to sort of uncertainty? So um, with those sort of framing remarks, let me start by um, inviting Alex Trachtenberg at the county level, and then we'll look at uh, Mark at the state level, and then we'll go to Karen and Mike from there. So take it away, Alex. Thanks, Rich. Uh, thanks, Christy. Uh, thanks to the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation and the Strategic Energy Institute for the invitation. Uh, it's definitely an honor to be able to share uh, and to share this space with uh, my fellow panelists um, and all the great work that they're doing. So uh, grateful to be here and to be able to share about what Fulton County's doing. Uh, as Rich said, I'm Alex Trachtenberg. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Manager for Fulton County Government here in Georgia. Uh, I've been in my role for a year today, actually. It's my one year anniversary. I just kind of realized that. Uh, I've, I've worked in the sustainability space for uh, more than a decade now. Uh, it's definitely my passion um, and, and something I'm honored to serve in my role uh, with Fulton County. So I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about, um, you know, some of our goals, our targets, our activities, collaborations, et cetera, as uh, Rich had teed it up. So in uh, 2019, uh, the county adopted its first sustainability and resilience plan. Uh, we had some great consultants work with us before my time, but uh, I have the pleasure of being responsible ultimately for its implementation with our partners and constituents and collaborators. Uh, but 2M Design, Coffer Engineering uh, were the lead consultants on that with the county uh, and my predecessor. Uh, so that was that plan was adopted and approved in 2019. Um, and then this year, uh, we actually doubled down and uh, our board of commissioners adopted a slate of updates uh, for 2030 goals. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those goals now. Uh, for 2025, we have a target to transition 20% of our fleet mileage to hybrid or other alternative fuel technology. Um, and then this, uh, this year, we made a 2030 update. Uh, to transition 25% or all light duty administrative vehicles to electric vehicles uh, and plug in hybrid electric vehicles, as well as to equitably install electric vehicle supply equipment or EV charging stations, if you will, uh, a minimum of a level two charger, uh, as well as looking at opportunities for DC fast chargers. Uh, the county has several hundred facilities uh, and buildings uh, across the jurisdiction. Uh, as folks probably know, uh, Fulton County is the most populous county in the state of Georgia. Out of 159, I think we're second to Texas in terms of number of counties. And uh, we're home to 15 cities and municipalities as well. Um, so we have about a million residents, uh, you know, really diverse geography, diverse demographics and people. 
Um, and it's a really great place to live. But uh, we have a lot of properties, uh, a lot of facilities where we can locate uh, charging stations, as well as where we park our fleet vehicles. We have about a thousand or so uh, fleet vehicles of a variety of light duty, medium and heavy duty use. Um, and with those 15 cities, you know, we certainly uh, partner with them a lot, uh, help to encourage each other to, uh, you know, make progress on our goals. So a little bit about the progress that we've made so far. Um, certainly more to do. Um, you know, I'll get into this a little bit. It's a, this is a new space for us um, in terms of transportation, electrification, moving towards electric vehicles and the infrastructure necessary to support them. Uh, at present, we have five alternative fuel vehicles, um, two plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and a few hybrid vehicles. Um, we have two non-public EV charging stations right now. So clearly we've got a lot of work to do, but we are making some progress. So this year, um, our goal is to have 40% of our light duty administrative vehicles uh, being replaced with alternative fuels, hybrids and plug-in hybrid electrics. Uh, a lot of how we do that purchasing is through the statewide uh, cooperative purchasing contract. Uh, it makes it a little bit more efficient in terms of procurement. Um, in 2023, we're planning to purchase more electric vehicles and install electric vehicle supply equipment. Uh, if folks may be familiar, we've renovated a lot of our libraries. We have about 32 libraries across the county. Um, and our flagship is our central library downtown in downtown Atlanta. Uh, we are prepared uh, for electric vehicle supply equipment there. We put in the electrical infrastructure to support that. Uh, we're in process of procuring uh, three electric vehicle charging stations at our Metropolitan Library in Southwest Atlanta. These would be for public use as well as for employee use, uh, likely to be level two chargers. And uh, we were fortunate to uh, get accepted into the Georgia Power Make Ready program. If folks aren't familiar with that, it's a great program that Georgia Power offers to help pay for the uh, electrical site infrastructure work and development at no cost to the county. Um, we are responsible to pay for and install and connect the charging units themselves. Uh, we're also going through a phase one. Uh, EV charging stations design and engineering uh, project right now at five of our county owned facilities across the county, north, south and central. Um, installation would hopefully happen in 2023, uh, but of course that's pending any uh, kind of county capital project funding or grant funding. I think we know there's a lot of money coming through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law um, and we're excited about that. We're mostly considering level two chargers in these scenarios. Maybe we'll, we'll have some opportunities for DC fast, but I think folks know there's a big delta uh, in terms of cost for those. And, you know, we have to evaluate the use cases and, you know, kind of this, the juice is worth the squeeze. Uh, we're considering these all for not just our fleet and employees, but also for public use as well. And I think our key objectives and really what's driving us in this electrification movement is climate change mitigation, an opportunity to drastically reduce our emissions, our impact on the environment, on communities. Uh, certainly there are economic cost savings to be realized uh, from the greater efficiency of these vehicles and uh, the, the reduced price. I think we're all feeling it at the pump these days. I know I am. Um, and also from an environmental and climate justice perspective. So whatever we can do to reduce our tailpipe emissions and pollution on road roadways and interstates, uh, often that you know, bisect and, and intersect uh, low and moderate income communities and communities of color, uh, where these communities were located due to historical urban renewal and redlining, we wanna make sure that we're reducing our impact as much as possible and those negative health impacts on uh, these particularly vulnerable communities. Um, you know, I think a project that we're really excited about right now is certainly the phase one electric vehicle supply equipment, the opportunity for next year to get a substantially greater portion of electric vehicles in our fleet. But I wanted to mention our Metropolitan Library Resilience Hub project as well. Uh, so Metropolitan Library is in Southwest Atlanta, Capital View, Capital Manor neighborhoods, and we are enhancing or improving this library to become a resilience hub. So what is that? It's a place where neighboring uh, residents and communities can go in times of emergency. Uh, they lose uh, power, water. There's some sort of a shock to the system, an extreme weather event, a big storm has come through, a tree has fallen and the power has gone out, whatever it might be. 
People need a place to go to be in community with each other, get access to resources and services and support and support each other with that social connectivity and cohesion. Uh, well, we have solar photovoltaics on the rooftop. We're gonna be installing battery storage. We're gonna be putting in a rainwater harvesting system. We're gonna be putting in a community garden and we're gonna be putting in electric vehicle supply equipment or charging stations as well. So we're really layering all these things together. And it's not just for those emergency situations or those shocks or stressors in the system, but it's really for that everyday use. This is a resource center. This is something that we want people to be able to go and uh, access educational opportunities, trainings, uh, you know, good resources and services that um, you know, the library already offers, but what can we add in to really improve community resiliency? You know, collaboration and partnerships are absolutely critical. Like I said, this is a new space for us. You know, we rely on our partners for their expertise and their guidance, working with people like Georgia Power, the Georgia Department of Transportation, nonprofits like the Electrification Coalition or Fourth Mobility, EV Hybrid Noir, uh, our, our great standby contractors and our constituents and community members, right? They have a lot of great experience and knowledge to add and share with us as well. Um, and I mentioned, you know, we're mostly incorporated in terms of the county. We have 15 cities. They have their own governance and services, and we really have to collaborate and build out a strong network of electric vehicles, electric vehicle supply equipment, be able to share best practices with each other. I'm a part of an excellent network across the Southeast region called the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network. It's just such an amazing capacity builder, knowledge exchange, and resource for me and my peers to learn about what's happening in this transportation electrification space. And they actually have a working group dedicated just to that. You know, we certainly, as we have this, you know, uh, electrification of transportation, this green revolution, clean energy, all these things, we really have to pay, pay attention to workforce development and education and training as well. Uh, we have education, training, and job placement goals in our sustainability and resilience plan. And, uh, you know, I think with electric vehicles, you know, maintenance, operations, installing the charging stations, there's a lot of opportunity for us to partner with groups like folks that are on this call, my fellow panelists, um, as well as our WorkSource Fulton uh, uh, work, Workforce Development Agency, other partners such as technical colleges and more. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, to have the opportunity to share with you all. And uh, we're excited to continue to move the needle um, here in Fulton County and in the state of Georgia. Excellent, Alex. Thank you. That's a great segue to the state of Georgia. So let's hear from Mark Smith with uh, GDOC. Yeah, thanks, Rich. And thanks for sharing that, Alex. And we'll look forward to partnering with you guys on what we have uh, coming up soon, um, which is uh, the state of Georgia um, and, and our chapter here began when the governor um, established the Electric Mobility and Innovation Alliance. Uh, last August of 2021, um, and that was led by Georgia Department of Economic Development, and it was a great collaboration uh, amongst the, the government, industry leaders, electric utilities, nonprofits, um, and et cetera. And out of that, um, the, the next phase was of November 15th of 2021, the federal government passed a bipartisan uh, infrastructure law. Uh, that created the NEVI program or NEVI formula program, um, which purpose is to build out a national network of uh, charging stations as we move towards this new uh, sort of new era. Uh, this is very new for GDOT. Uh, if you think of it in the last century, a uh, Department of Transportation had nothing to do with, uh, you know, the fueling stations uh, across uh, state. So this is a very new space, but an exciting space uh, as we are collaborating with our state energy um, agency, um, because on a national level, this is a Department of Transportation and Department of Energy uh, partnership uh, to the fact that they opened up a new joint program office um, that is helping states with the vision and uh, technical assistance in getting our plan ready uh, for approval. So our state plan is due on August 1st. Um, it's been a pretty uh, a pretty tight schedule 
Um, so we have a lot to pull in, a lot to learn, which included um, round six uh, call for nominations of additional um, alternative fuel corridors. Uh, that deadline is tomorrow. Um, so we are uh, in, in currently uh, finalizing a um, couple of corridors, which we will announce um, as soon as uh, we submit those nominations and they are approved. Um, and in that, um, we should highlight that what we are focused on in this program, uh, the secretary has made it uh, very clear that um, in the first year, the Department of Transportation will not consider all corridors fully built out because there are new requirements that we have to meet. Um, so for example, those requirements have changed to um, corridors that are every 50 miles um, and a um, at least a mile uh, or a mile or less from the interstate. And so in the first year of the funds, we will be um, fully building out our um, alternative fuel corridors. Uh, the great thing here um, that we've recently learned is Georgia's uh, number three in states that are corridor ready. Um, so it's kind of broken down into corridor pending, corridor ready, um, and now the new um, standard, which is fully built out. So Georgia is in a really great place here. Um, and what that means is uh, it probably opens up in that first year when we get all our alternative fuel corridors fully built out, that we can spend more money um, um, outside of our interstates, um, which is where we will partner uh, with many local governments, um, private uh, partnerships, um, nonprofits, and et cetera. Uh, I should note that this is a five-year program. Uh, the state of Georgia will receive uh, approximately $120 million um, to spend over the next five years. Um, it seems like it's not much, but again, uh, Georgia being uh, very well prepared going into this fully built out stage does help you know, spread that money across the board. Um, more efficiently and effectively for us. And I'll go through uh, sort of what the, um, there, there are two, two things that I wanted to make sure to highlight here. Um, and, and Alex, thanks for your question prior to this on uh, the, the grant programs uh, that will come out of here. And we're actually anticipating right now the federal government set up in addition to the formula program, um, two discretionary grant programs. Uh, one is for corridors and one are for communities. And that's a total of $2.5 billion in which uh, local entities, the state, nonprofits, anyone can apply for those grants. Uh, as of right now, we don't have much guidance around that. Uh, we are actually anticipating to receive that guidance on tomorrow. Um, so uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, if this were held on tomorrow, I would have more information on that. But as soon as we have that, we will, of course, uh, go through that guidance and share with a lot of our partners. Um, as we notice, there is a lot of interest in communities um, building up across the state, which is great, um, specifically in disadvantaged communities and rural communities, um, which the the NEVI program um, really does hone in on is making sure that our rural communities are prepared, but also that, you know, the disadvantaged communities have the, the equity that's necessary for EV um, infrastructure um, and EV vehicles to um, be successful in this next turn of the decade here. Um, and then I'll touch on some of the requirements for our plan. Um, as we've mentioned, this is a big collaborative process. So the plan requires us to um, have coordination across many of our state agencies, um, public engagement, public feedback, um, but also some consideration of the labor and workforce, which is a huge component here um, that we will be working with our team to, to, to show the federal government, this is how we will address um, those concerns, those constraints, 
um, and the needs to build up the workforce uh, to deal with this infrastructure that we are seeing. Um, and lastly, um, I will note that, you know, I already mentioned that Georgia is number three in corridor ready, um, but I will also know one of the unique places where Georgia is is that we are number one in EV auto registrations in the Southeast. And so you can imagine here as a state um, and to many of our partners across the state, this is a very pivotal moment. It's very exciting. And one of the things that we have witnessed as we're already working with the utility side is that we're all in this together. Um, so uh, this space is so new that there's not much apprehension around different partners that are there that we all want uh, to pull together and make this uh, implementation of the Navy Formula Program successful for the state overall. And so I'll end there. Thank you. Excellent, Mark. Thank you. That's good. Uh, let's go now to Karen with the zero mission uh, with WSP. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot to unpack, you know, with all this <laughs> EV stuff. And I'm going to take a step back and look nationally and also with um, the public transit lens. So um, like Rich said, um, my name is Karen. I'm from WSP. I'm the zero mission market lead for um, zero mission vehicles in the Southeast. But I come from a public transit background. I've been working in public transit for 25 years. So I'm I'm always thinking about how are the human beings going to be impacted by this um, and how quickly this transition is happening. Now, there was an industry event for public transportation last fall held in Orlando. Last one was held four years ago. It's this big, I call it the you know, transit Disneyland, you know, Super Bowl for transit. There wasn't a single diesel bus on the floor for demo. It was all electric buses and then this one sad little CNG vehicle. So it lets you know like how ready at least the bus manufacturer market is. Um, but there's a lot of elements that go into a transit agency or anybody going to zero emissions transition because it's not just about the vehicle. It's about the workforce. How, how, do, who, how are you procuring your parts? How your fuel man is no longer Sunoco, it's now Georgia Power. How does that relationship changes? And, I'll admit, none of the individual steps that you need to do to have a successful zero emission transition is difficult, but if you don't plan them all ahead, you'll get in trouble. Cause you know, I, I don't know why, but Georgia Power might have other projects going on besides your project that they're trying to align with the, with the uh, utility needs or, you know, hey, there might be a global pandemic that makes wild things happen with supply chain. And suddenly, you know, Unless you can buy a charging infrastructure off of Amazon, you're not finding it. Um, and then the other thing, and, and I love that the workforce has already been mentioned, you know, the public transit workforce, they never got to work from home. They've been on the front lines this entire time. And while they're excited about the zero emission transition, they're also tired. So having a little bit of empathy on how you're approaching them on how, hey, your job, you know, at the end of the day, job isn't going to change. The bus is still going to go and pick up people safely, drop them off safely. Um, maybe how you do that to get the maximum efficiency will change a little. Um, you know, maintenance will have to have new procedures to be able to be safe around high voltage equipment. Um, but if you plan all that ahead, you know, you can have a successful transition. And it's the same, the other exciting part of this, you know, I always say it's how the human beings interact. So, you know, it's talking about first the inside of the transit agency. But the other piece that's important, this is how the human beings that we serve on public transit are impacted. How are they, you know, now generally the areas where transit is running are areas that are poor air quality, um, lower income individuals that have higher propensity for asthma. They need those access to the clean vehicles. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and excitement um, all around these transitions. Um, it is rapidly evolving. It is, it, is, it is crazy how quickly just the technology is evolving, the tools in which to handle the technology. Um, like on the public transit side, the bus isn't the hard part, but you know the charge management, the information you can get from the charging station and when's the best time to charge so you can maximize um, 
the infrastructure that you're using, you're not putting excess strain on the grid, you're getting the best price, but you're getting all your vehicles charged. How do you manage that? What workforce do you need to manage that? Now you might need more maybe IT savvy people, electrical savvy people, as opposed to diesel mechanics. Um, and then, uh, you know, one thing that's also is very interesting around this is, and I think it was touched on a little bit, is the resiliency question. Um, and, and I'm finding that with these zero emission transitions, everything is very individual. Like, what does that agency, municipality, private or organization, what are their goals? Like for some people, their, their goal around resiliency is, you know, you talk about Florida, um, they may wanna take that bus and hook it up to an, a critical facility so they can use that to power it. Other agencies may say, well, we wanna have extra power storage because we're using those vehicles for evacuation. Um, so you have to understand what a, you know, on the resiliency piece, what are your critical goals around that and then plan around that. But it's, it's an exciting time. There's so many different strings to pull at. Um, but I think the important thing that I'm seeing, you know, first off is having a good master plan, but then also being understanding, because a lot of times we do plans and we set them up on the shelf and we do nothing with them five years. <laughs> this is going to be a very fluid and flexible plan. But at least if you have the, the plan and the roadmap, you know where all the scary things are, and now you can manage those scary things and move forward, but also being able to adjust as all the, the technology advances change. And that's just public transit. We haven't even touched like the ports, all that other stuff, but I'll stop there. Yeah. No, that's excellent. And we are iterating along this adventure. It's a choose your own adventure book, right? <laughs> uh, let's go to Mike Tinsky for some prepared remarks. Thanks. Um, well, Alex, Mark, and Karen really uh, summarized the, the state really well, and it's really exciting to see how much momentum and energy is going into uh, into, into the vehicle sp electric vehicle space. Um, I'll just be really brief and just mention um, a little bit more on the product side and, and why I believe this momentum is now up upon us. Um, I, I started in electric vehicles in 2008. Uh, at, at Ford and you know I was I was faced with you know what is the company's strategy towards electrification and um, it was a much different picture you can imagine you know the cost of batteries was outrageous um, I, I still remember it was twelve hundred and fifty dollars a kilowatt hour um, and the you know the infrastructure was non-existent and so when you're looking at investing in a vehicle platform that can cost several billion dollars uh, it's a big bet to, 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 uh, to put that kind of money down um, when you had these big challenges. So Ford took, um, I think, the right approach. <laughs> Maybe it's because it was my idea, uh, but just kidding. Uh, but, you know, we took gasoline engines and we modified them to be electric vehicles. So the, in 2012, the Ford Focus Electric uh, was launched and it sold in the volumes that we were comfortable with. And it sold where we got the learnings. We understood how customers... Uh, Ford understood how customers could could um, recharge these vehicles and what have you. But um, just to give you the sense of, of how fast things are moving, it took between, so the Nissan Leaf came out in 2010. So that's kind of where we start the electrification journey. Um, it took up till 2016 to reach 1% market share. So six years for that first percent. But then uh, by 2018, we doubled. So we hit 2% in 2018. And then 3% um, came along just in 2020, but then we doubled again in 2021 with a six and a half percent share. So we're seeing that if you call it the hockey, uh, hockey stick shape um, of, of uh, adoption, we're seeing us into the high slope area where we are seeing double, uh, double um, uh, of market share on electric vehicles. And that's happened just as we'd hope, maybe it's a little you know, longer than anticipated, um, but, you know, the battery prices are now below $200 a kilowatt hour. Um, the infrastructure is getting much more capable. I think the, 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 the panelists on this phone are probably thinking about 300 kilowatts or higher um, and get those charge times. I think the next, call it chapter, we keep with that theme, the next chapter is going to be around, you know, how do you get the refill times to be equivalent uh, to a gasoline vehicle? And that's about, and if you do the, you know, sort of the back of the envelope math, that requires about 1.4 megawatts of power, oh, huge amounts of power uh, to, to be able to, and, and obviously the battery and the vehicle has to handle that kind of power. But, you know, if, if we take the cost element out and we then we take the, call it the time element out, 
um, and you get all the other benefits, the climate benefits, the, the, you know, the, the obviously the performance benefits, it's, you know, you, you, you've taken all the excuses away uh, from the customers, whether they're, uh, you know, fleet customers or transportation, public service or public transport customers, you've taken all of those uh, excuses away. And so I'm, I'm really bullish. Uh, obviously, everyone on this call is very bullish around electrification. But this next chapter, I think, is going to be really exciting um, in terms of, you know, where, where we're going next. So um, I'll, I'll pause there and, and turn it back over to Rich and happy to answer any other questions. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of one or two quick questions that we have to discuss um, and then a couple from the audience. Uh, the first one is really about infrastructure costs. Uh, I think going back to my analogy about the mobile phone development and IT, we realize it wasn't just the device. And Mike points out the development and the products, the battery cost declines. It's really the whole network that is needed to support these, these new technologies. And obviously there was probably as much done um, from that original Motorola phone on the, on the wire side, on the infrastructure, same thing with IT, cloud computing. We're seeing that in the grid uh, as well. So I guess the question, and obviously there's several pieces to that, not to get too far out of scope. I think for this panel, what I'm interested in is, given your uh, role, um, how are we ensuring that we're spending the money uh, at the right place, the right time, and for the right applications. Um, and because we've talked a little about corridor, we talked about urban use, um, Karen mentioned transit. We know there's some fleet opportunities that may be more public, I'm sorry, um, uh, business case oriented around private businesses. Um, so I guess the general question we'll just go through the line is, how are we ensuring good use of capital and that we know that we're making uh, informed decisions? Uh, we'll go through in the order that we presented. How about Alex first? I think we have to think about where are the people going? You know, um, we need to look at, you know, commuting patterns, you know, our, our facilities, the parking lots, you know, what kind of vehicles are they using? When are they coming? Um, those kinds of things. Like I mentioned, we have several hundred buildings and properties all across a pretty large geography. And it's a very, the county is very diverse across a variety of demographics, as well as if you talk about what kind of transportation modes or vehicles or, you know, habits they might have. And of course, with the pandemic, you know, we're seeing something different with more telecommuting and teleworking and more remote work. So we're not seeing as many people at our facilities, but as we reopen, we are starting to see more and more come back. So we're starting to look at that. We were intentional about selecting these five county locations for our phase one for EV charging stations, thinking about, you know, are people going there to access whatever it might be, pay their taxes, renew their tag, um, whatever it might be they come to a county facility for. Um, and also do we have fleet parking there overnight as well. Um, so, you know, I, I know with, for us, and I think, you know, is, is true anywhere, that infrastructure cost outside of the charging unit itself is often much more expensive. And we know that we have a lot of facilities that are older, we have deferred maintenance, We've got old, you know, electrical uh, panels and transformers, et cetera, that we're really going to have to leverage these partnerships and these funding sources that might be coming either through the utility, uh, the state, the federal government, et cetera, so that we have that infrastructure upgraded and we can, you know, be able to use the dollars that we have at the county as responsibly and effectively and equitably as possible. Um, so we're trying to look at, you know, where are the people going, you know, where are the best use cases, but where are the opportunities in the future too, where we know that there's going to be more adoption and we want to make sure that they're ready, um, you know, when they need to access charging stations or whatever it might be. Excellent. Mark, uh, how are you informing these decisions uh, at your point, GDOT? Yeah, um, so I'll kind of 
use overview like our methodology going into um, how we decided what corridors to look at that we would nominate for tomorrow. Um, and so our team, uh, we, we, we contracted with EY, um, who has great expertise in this area, and they have sub consultants at JLL um, and HNTB. And so part of that sort of the what we what we scored some of these corridors on were, you know, annual average daily traffic, real estate feasibility, uh, whether or not they run an evacuation route, um, geographic balance, um, as well as work on economic development on tourism, uh, because I think uh, that's a good, uh, you know, place to focus on. Um, and then the counties on um, EV adoption, right? And so looking at where we, we would nominate on that scoring method um, for those different categories to determine where we have to fully build out and fill that first year of, of monies. The next um, is that this plan is very, uh, ha has a heavy market-driven research um, approach to it. Um, so again, looking at where are people um, with EVs living, where are they traveling to? Um, and so that's a lot of the data that we're constantly pulling through and that we have to work with, uh, with Department of Revenue on, economic development, um, and a lot of our local partners. So I think uh, that's kind of the big overview and the, and the approach that we are taking right now um, on the data side. Excellent. Great answer. Um, and then with uh, Karen, some views on maybe the transit with your background there and uh, how should we be thinking about some of these questions about ridership and where people are going to need what? Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I like to take these questions and then break them. Um, because we have we have great priorita prioritization tools for for existing federal projects that look at you know all the boxes we want to check, but do we truly want to do a one for one transition? Is do we want to have the same model where I own a gasoline automobile? Like we know people are okay with sharing on Uber and Lyft and microtransit, so. You know, part of it, this is also thinking like, how do we want to disrupt that model so that we can provide equitable services across the board? You know, so now is it is it more mass transit options with EV or shared use, like smaller shared use options, because maybe people aren't OK with a bus, but they're OK with a smaller vehicle. And then also, and I don't know how to answer, solve this problem, but there's, you know, there's a real challenge with, you know, right now, if you want to own an EV car, like you're of a certain status, like how do you make that? available and equitable for all. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm in an apartment complex. There's two EV chargers. And I can tell you the two people that are parked there, so one's a Tesla Model S and one's a white Prius. And then anybody else that wants to buy an EV and park there, good luck. And I'm in downtown Lawrenceville. Like I'm not in a challenge area where that's particularly challenged. So that, you know, that gets even harder. So, um, you know, public transit, like we have processes to evaluate current projects and you know, anyone that knows me in the region knows I will fight to get all the money I can for transit because it's it's a public good and then having it as EV. But, you know, I think some of this is also challenging how we think about how we're changing things from what we currently do, which isn't necessarily bad, but maybe we can do this and adapt it better. Great, thank you. Uh, Mike, what about your view on uh, how to inform good decisions and spend yeah. time? Yeah, I think one of the great advantages we have in this uh, this time is is the connected vehicles, right? So every every vehicle is essentially has a modem and is communicating data. So all the automakers have tremendous amounts of data of where these vehicles are driven and where they're parked. And I think if um, we as collectively use that data intelligently and use data analytics, it will predict where we need to put charge stations. It will it will guide the teams um, to the right answer and the most efficient answer. And I think that the other lesson we learned, um, I think it was a hard lesson learned during the Recovery Act. So this was 2008, 2009. There was a tremendous amount of money spent on what you might call level two infrastructure. 
and um, that data was all available. And, and I think the lesson learned is, it, it's, everyone knows this now, is you have to match dwell time to the charge uh, power. And mm -hmm. you know, the, the, if somebody's gonna go to a convenience store, they're not gonna spend three hours in the convenience store. And that, that lesson is very intuitive now, um, but it wasn't intuitive back then. And so I think we're just, um, we're a much more uh, informed group now. So I think the right answers will, will materialize. Very good. Um, and I would just build one more comment. I think Karen mentioned this challenge around multifamily, uh, multi you know, like apartments, people that don't have a necessarily a designated spot every night, or they're not going to be sure. This is a serious challenge because uh, I think the other trend we've seen on the on the individual ownership model is the vehicle ranges are getting longer. We're getting to where there's less range anxiety. We we know in the last five years, uh, we've moved into a range where a lot of people are comfortable, 150 miles of daily EV uh, capability, where that sort of then liberates them from needing necessarily to charge at work. Uh, on the other hand, if they don't have a garage space or a level two equipped uh, access point nearby home, they're not in that in that um, potential market. So what are their options? And I think. Those are great questions to inform where and how um, sort of provide that access and take that um, concern and deal with it. Um, then uh, we do have a, a question that's sort of related to, this is from the audience, uh, Paul Todd, and um, uh, about uh, debate around whether the electric grid can handle a huge increase in the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, I'll take the first uh, crack at that. Um, you know, what we evaluated in Georgia, and by the way, kudos to the governor and the task force, we did explore some of these questions. Um, there's a very good process for planning for generation resources. And so I think when it comes down to the Southeast is actually in a good position in its uh, capacity to provide electric power. And it looks like that's the case probably through 2028 maybe beyond. Now, the more nuanced part of this question is, will that power be available at the time and the location that we need to support this EV trend? There's a huge um, demand uh, peak, we would call it in the late afternoon, especially in summer when there's large AC loads. And then the grid is sort of at very close to its uh, capacity with some tolerance, um, obviously baked in by, by regulatory law. Uh, but at other times, there's a lot of available capacity. So I think the question for this group and others that are trying to work on this challenge, and we're doing some work here at Georgia Tech, not only on this question of space and time, but also the flavor of energy, right? So we know um, it might have a, a natural gas component to provide base load power, and that has a certain carbon signature. And if it's afternoon, it might have a heavier solar component. But in the middle of the night, we don't have much wind in the Southeast, at least onshore in Georgia. Uh, we are gonna be relying probably from fossil fuels and nuclear uh, for some of those base loads. And if a lot of our charging is gonna occur, um, you know, in the, in the wee hours of the morning or the commute, for example, um, that will have CO2 implications. Uh, let me let me let other comment um, other panelists comment on the question of the capability to handle um, some of this growth from the grid. Yeah. yeah, maybe I'll just chime in real quick, Rich. I, you, I think you hit it on that nail on the head. The um, you know the the U.S. is really doing well in terms of smart meter deployment. And for those that don't know what those are, it's basically electric meters that uh, on on residential homes and businesses that measure. The amount of electricity used at per time and it really does it's a key enabler and um where you can essentially introduce time of use rates so the the cost of electricity can vary and with electric vehicles in many cases being discretionary of when they charge you can send a price signal to essentially motivate um, customers to charge those vehicles during those times that you mentioned rich um uh, you know lower peak 
And so it's taken some time. There's a lot of fear uh, within the consumer base of, you know, are my electric rates going to go up if I go to a time of use rate? And, and there's a lot of education that has to happen. But I do think that that's the ultimate solution is put a price signal out there and people will find, you know, the lowest cost time to charge mm-hmm. because, you know, they're sleeping during uh, many of these hours uh, for at least for, for the residential side. So I think that will likely play into the play into the solution. I think that that dovetails with comments panelists made earlier about uh, where people are going, what they're going to need, and and Karen's important point about the evolution that we're looking at a future state that's not like the one we have today. Uh, But managed charging is going to be enabling. The ability to coordinate these resources, um, a a very simple example I guess is if all four of my neighbors, immediate neighbors, adopt an EV, (laughs) there's actually a distribution box from the power company that might get stressed unless it has some knowledge of what else is behind that distribution box. Smart metering is one way. I think closing the loop with consumer apps is useful. Mike mentioned that the vehicles are now very intelligent. Um, There are some barriers around some of the proprietary and legal aspects and privacy of that data, both for the vehicle and the utility. But I think we can overcome them because it does serve uh, the societal needs better if we can share that and learn and and really, as I said, optimize the expense of capital. And uh, I'd like to jump in with two quick things. You know, the charge management is just as important on the public transit side too. And that's one way that utilizing the nighttime to charge the buses and having them run the day, then it doesn't impact the grid as much. But then, um, and I am not a hydrogen expert by any stretch of the imagination, but hydrogen, you know, does have a role to play in this. I think (laughs) when you get the hydrogen folks on the call, they they all have their opinions on what that role is, you know, but some people have, have mentioned either as a fuel source, but also as a way to store energy at, you know, when you, you have the time where you can create more energy, but you don't need it and then be able to expend it at the, at the peak time. So I think, mm-hmm. you know, some of this is not going to, and none of this is going to be solved by all one thing. It's going to mm-hmm. be a very collaborative, just like with collaboration with people, it's going to be a collaboration with resources in terms of being able yeah. to solve these, these challenges that we have ahead of yeah. us. Yeah, it's a huge amount of money and need, and there's the whole supply chain aspects, which we don't cover in this panel, but they're definitely uh, something to keep track of. Um, there's another quick one from the, um, the audience, and then I'll go to a, a closing comment. There's a question around partnering with logistics companies like UPS. It's not really targeted to a given panelist, but I think this idea around uh, whether we should use public money to fund, you know, couriers like that, or whether that should be passed through through the services, um, is a good one. So maybe for the public officials, uh, Alex and Mark, uh, do you have ideas on how we're kind of interfacing with them to ensure they have what they need? I will say, I, as of right now, we, I, I don't think the federal program has, has directed that way. There are a couple of other programs um, in the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, that funding can be used for fleets. So there, there is a, a fleet component to it, but not under the NEVI formula program. Um, however, uh, we are partnering with a lot of companies. For example, yesterday we met with, as we know, Rivian's coming here. Rivian will be, um, you know, their their next plan is working with Amazon on electrifying their vans. Um, and so working with the partners that will be, you know, in the private sector that are leading that along with some of those companies like Amazon, FedEx, or UPS, I think it does open up the door for where the state may go in that direction, um, especially as we look at um, other fleet plans that we do have. So I hate that I don't have a very clear answer, but I do see that coming up pretty soon. Thank you. Um, Great. And I'll just say I have talked to UPS a little bit and other carriers, and I think they're looking at states that provide sort of incentives to do things, but obviously they're also looking at the business model. And obviously the subsidy is a big part of their calculation. So they're deciding to move or not move in certain states where it's favorable or unfavorable. Question is, could could you do something 
proactive in Georgia that stimulates that and would that pay back? Um, all right, we have a, a few more minutes and we wanna end at the top of the hour. So I just have uh, one final pass through the panel here and you have a two part question. One is um, how will the work you are doing today influence uh, the world of mobility in 2030? And a personal question, what do you think you'll be driving in five, five years or, or, or five or six years? Uh, we'll go through in the same order. Go ahead, Alex. Sure, so hopefully in 2030, we've achieved our goal of transitioning our, you know, large portion of our fleet to uh, EVs. And, uh, you know, we have electric vehicle charging stations located you know, in areas that make sense, as folks have talked about some of these factors of methodology, but, you know, at, as many of our facilities, um, our buildings as, as possible. Um, and to have those be able to be shared between uh, employees and fleet, but also to be available for um, the public for sure. Um, I and I just got another car. It's not an EV, but I will say in five years, uh, which is probably about or so when I might transition, I certainly plan to purchase an electric vehicle. Great. If I can afford it. Yeah. Sure. Great I assume point. price will be better than probably. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think a lot of people are in that boat. Uh, Mark, um, how's your work going to influence 2030? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Written in law is one, our, the, the goal here for the Navy program is by 2030 to have 500,000 nationwide, 500,000 EV chargers nationwide. And so um, I think the work we do here, we look forward to Georgia um, being a leading state there um, and to fulfilling the national goal and being a hub for uh, charging here in the Southeast. Um, and then, and the bigger goal uh, that we see um, is putting us on a path of net zero emissions no later than 2050. Um, and then as far as, uh, we do have an EV at home. Hey. Um, we still have uh, gas cars because we experienced uh, range anxiety a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, so very excited about this um, as we're moving forward because we really don't take the, the, the car on long distance drives right, uh, because good. of our experience, so. Awesome. All right, uh, one minute each for Karen and Mike, close us out. Yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet. I think, you know, uh, I can't tell you exactly what all the technology is gonna look like in the future, but I'd like to see us having systems approaches to solving our problems, making sure that we understand all the inputs and and the things that touch the things that we're, we're we're adjusting to make sure that the the solution is the greater good and and not being afraid to, to to disrupt things i think and i think that's some of the things that have come out positively from the pandemic and from some of the other disruptive technologies we're a little more open to disruptive um and then for me hands down a vw buzz because i've always wanted a vw bus and oh. you know i'm going to be first in line to get one of those little electric buses when they come out. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right, with, Mike. With, with the flowers too, Karen. <laughs> awesome. So um, how do I see my work influencing? I, I've uh, obviously pivoted my career towards teaching. Um, and so I'm hoping that I can uh, produce some more uh, engineers that are interested and passionate about the electrification space. Um, and then uh, car of driving in five years, I think I'll be uh, air taxi, uh, quad rotor, air taxi, probably autonomous. Just kidding. Um, probably a Ford Mach-E, next generation. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Let me thank everyone again. Thank you for attending. Thank the panelists. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. They were awesome. And I think the main theme is this type of convene and coordination is happening more and more. Uh, we need you, we need the public discourse. And I'm so happy to be involved in this community. Uh, thanks for joining today. Great. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today uh, to the Strategic uh, Energy Institute for putting this great panel together. This is our last um, spring webinar um, for this semester, but we will um, come back in the fall uh, with more Smarter Together webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.